Um, to sort of vamp off of Jonas's preamble, um, I'm not that smart. I'm uh, I'm really uh, I'm a decent programmer, but um, compared to a lot of people who work on Bitcoin, I barely know what I'm doing. I I kind of consider myself like a carpenter, like the sort of digital carpenter equivalent. Um, I'm a steady hand. I can get things done. Um, I'm fairly patient, which is key when it comes to Bitcoin core development. Because trust me, you're gonna be doing a lot of waiting around and a lot of rebasing. But um, fundamentally, I don't think I'm that smart. So that's why this talk is low budget. Um, so two things working against me. Not only am I not that smart, but um, SegWit's an incredibly robust topic in Bitcoin. It basically encompasses like every component of the system from uh, the peer-to-peer -peer layer, game theoretical aspects, uh, commitment structures, um, migration paths, activation, politics. Uh, there's a whole lot going on there. So, so when Jonas asked me to do an advanced segue talk, uh, there's a lot of um, leeway there. So with SegWit in particular, I find that um, when I was in your guys' shoes about a year ago, um, I, I had been like in the Bitcoin ecosystem for a few years, and um, you know had had done a few pull requests and stuff, and was following SegWit casually. But I found that I really had to review the fundamentals and the basics of SegWit numerous times to really get it through my head. Um, and so, what I'm hoping to do is is kind of go through some of the basics of SegWit, um, and then uh, once we do just a quick review of that. Maybe we can move on to a few snippets of code that are kind of relevant that will allow you to dig in um, a little bit more into the particulars and hopefully give you an intuition for how you can go off and uh, study some of this, this stuff yourself. Um, we have a few people in the audience who honestly probably have a deeper insight into some of the design choices uh, than I do. Uh, Marco and James C. and I'm sure uh, a lot of you at this point are really fluent. So. I'm hoping to uh, uh, judiciously lean on you with, with uh, questions. So let's jump into the basics. Um, so fundamentally, uh, what are some of the features of Segway? Like, you know, what does it do? Who can tell me about um, the malle malleability end of things? Let's say Fabian. Taking notes already. Uh, you should be taking notes. You should be just like <laughs> soaking this notes. in. You guys are too serious. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, th there were um, several ways to malleate uh, transactions um, be before Segwit came around, and um, yeah, Segwit. Uh, I mean, uh, several of those would have been fixable without Segwit, with some uh, with some standardization. But uh, some of them weren't, um, and um, yeah, SegWit fixed those by separating out. Yep, that's all correct. But backing up, I guess, what's the problem with malleability? Why is why is that an issue? Um, why is it a problem that basically you can take a transaction that's yet to be confirmed with one ID and create sort of an equivalent transaction with an alternate ID? Um, Consistency in your if you replicate that if you store like the transaction ID in your database and then you, you, you say you paid out this person already and then you look at the, uh, you look at the confirmed transaction they never confirmed and then they might uh, say, hey, this transaction you never confirmed and then send me my money and then you send it twice. Yep. Also, yeah. if you're building dependent transactions on that original one, off-chain. Yep. Like yep. Lightning. Yep. Yeah, so um, crucially, this, this is important for Lightning because with Lightning and similar schemes, we're kind of setting up these these dependent chains where you have to have some reliability in terms of the, the identifier. Um, so uh, allegedly, back when uh, a lot of the early Lightning discussion and just discussion was happening, um, I think there was some kind of way of getting around malleability. So if SegWit hadn't come around, we could still maybe have Lightning. Does anybody know how that scheme worked? There was uh, I gave it up about Deep sixty two. It fixed everything except the problem in the signature. In the end, someone can regenerate the signature. Yeah. So as long as the signature was part of the transaction itself, we couldn't really like do it. Uh huh. Uh huh. But no, nobody else, like no, nobody outside, 
who had like a private key for uh, uh, to sign for that transaction could mediate it. So everybody, uh, yeah. Okay, Antoine, what's BIP sixty two? Oh, BIP sixty two. It's a try to fix mediated issues. There are nine of them, and like he shall say, I mean, on this last one, are not fixable at all. And the main thing they were trying to, uh, that SIPA tried to do with the BIP 62 was uh, fixing third party malleability. Because there is two kinds of malleabilities there is malleability by the one who signed the transaction and malleability by people relating <coughs> the transaction with the network. So I think it's important. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Man, you guys are really good. All right. So uh, fundamentally, what SegWit does to prevent this malleability is it segregates the signature data um, and creates two different identifier schemes. So uh, this first serialization format here is sort of like the classic TXID serialization. And um, what's kind of a subtle distinction here to note is that previously the signature data was embedded in this TXIN's data structure here. So you'd have all your signature data on there as the script sig. Um, and then in this uh, WTXID, format here, this witness transaction ID format. The witness is actually pulled out of the TXNs um, and into this witness structure, which is sort of a, let's see, do I have this here? No. Um, the witness structure is like a list of lists where each element in there is a witness stack that corresponds to each TXN. Um, and it's important to note that for, for all the TXNs here in a witness native transaction, uh, the script sig is empty. So um, that's why it can't be malleated. So we still actually, when we have like a native SegWit um, uh, transaction, um, we still use both of these IDs format, ID formats, and, and this one can't be malleated because there's really no signature data in there. OK, so, oh yeah, James. So let me ask a question. Um, I never understood why the witnesses were aggregated in a vector at the end. Why, why are they not still part of the TXNs? It's that we have a marker. We have a marker that tells us this is a different serialization format. Yep, 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 yep. Yeah, so I guess I guess what you could do in that case is um, assuming you wanted the witness data to actually still live in line with the TXN, you could have some procedural parsing routine that would go through and strip out that data if you wanted to compute the, uh, the TXID. Whereas I guess here, um, you know, maybe. Okay, got it. So if I want to, okay, it's really to like easier TXID. Yeah, there's just less processing, I guess, because you can just kind of say like, you know, use this offset, you know, disregard everything after that, and then pick up the end lock time at the end. Uh, yeah, I don't know the reason, but my guess would be that it would be easier to uh, create transactions that are both valid to serial deserialize. <laughs> Non-witness and witness. If you're allowed to put witness, which is basically random garbage in the TXNs, right. uh, so the I mean the reason for the mark and the flag was to like give some just like to generally make transactions invalid to deserialize as um, non-witness yeah. transactions. It doesn't work always, but right. So the next kind of feature of SegWit is a fix for this uh, quadratic sig hash problem. Um, and basically the idea there at a high level, uh, is anybody familiar with this, this thing? Luciana, do you know what's going on with quadratic sig hashing? Um, sorry. Amidi? No? All right, good. Finally. Something you guys don't know. Um, so the... The issue with quadratic sig hashing is that you can construct uh, these transactions um, that take sort of a pathologically long time to validate. And the way that you do this, I think, in practice, is create a, a really giant multi-sig transaction. And what's happening is when you're trying to validate the spend of this transaction, um, you have, say, some subset of keys, and you're trying to figure out if, if those keys um, cover sort of the required um, script pub key. Does anybody else have any, any more insight into this? I thought we talked about that yesterday. I, I don't know if it was multi-sig, though. I thought it was just a lot of inputs. Oh, did, I, I think in, yeah, it's n squared, so so one n is like the, the, the number of inputs. 
Uh, so if that, if that grows enough, you have to hash more. But since by growing the amount of inputs, you also grow the size of the transaction. So you also have to grow, uh, you have to uh, hash more. And then you have to hash it for each input mm -hmm. because each input might be different. Uh, there's a different transaction hash. You can reuse the transaction hash what you signed for uh, for that. And I think that's because one signature includes information about the other somehow. Is that, or, or so it's not the same. Yeah. I, I so because I have to include the pre, the, pre, the previous uh, Pokey script. I have to rehash the whole darn thing for every input. Yeah. I can't reuse that hash. Mm, okay. So as as the transaction grows in size, the hash operation for every individual. Input will also increase, so it becomes quadratic. I think that was the. Yep, yep, yep. That sounds right. So to be honest, I, I don't really know what Segwit does to fix this. There's some kind of caching that happens. It's like one hash for that transaction, um, and that, that's what you're gonna sign, no matter where, no matter which input. I think. So it's linear, not quadratic. It's linear. Yeah. I think. All right, well, I'll gloss over that. Um, <laughs> there's a better uh, pay to script hash security. So does anybody have any idea why this would be? Timo? No. OK, this is kind of a subtle one. I didn't really realize this is the case until I went back and reviewed um, in the last few days. But the idea here is that um, with a sort of legacy pay to script hash, um, you're taking some <coughs> Uh, encumbrance script and you're hashing it and saying okay so when you redeem when you spend this coin you basically have to present me a script that hashes to the same value that I committed to um, as well as evaluating it to true um, and for that hash we actually use hash 160 which targets a, a, a range of 20 bytes um, and in SegWit um, that commitment is actually 32 bytes, so you're getting the full security of SHA-256 versus some kind of reduction. Yeah, I just wanted to say it's more than the, the amount of bytes. Like, RIPMD has, you can even lower the security more in SHA-256 right now. No one knows how to lower the security. Mm. Yeah. Why, why is that? Is it just because that's, the RIPMD has been with us longer, so there was more research into it, and I think that even come up with a way to make it 80 by bit security, 80, like half of the 160. Mm -hmm. Still not breakable yet, but uh, 200, SHA-256 right now, there isn't real research that can lower the security. There will be probably, but yeah. yeah. So it's more than the, the amount of bytes, it's actually a different algorithm that's right now weaker. Right, 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 right. So um, I guess, just as a sort of thought experiment, assuming that this RIPMD was uh, um, was prone to such an attack, isn't isn't hash one sixty uh, SHA and then Y? Yeah, yeah. yeah but you take some subset uh, or or right like projects it into a smaller space. Right. Um, so there's there's a higher likelihood of collision. And you still have to find a collision to, yeah. between. Oh, okay. Yeah. So yeah. So I guess given given um, given the sort of insecurity here, who can give me a practical example of how you would attack this? I, mean, I guess, like you were saying, you'd have to find a collision with a script that was different than the one that it was signing. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Brute force and, or otherwise. Yep. Yeah, exactly. And so at time of deployment, I think Peter noted that. Currently, um, a sufficiently motivated attacker with, with with a lot of resources could actually find a collision because um, it's like like you said. I think it's like eight bits of security, and at the time, at least, he said that that was that amounted to a few weeks of the global Bitcoin hash rate. So, you know, kind of worth keeping in mind. Although the Bitcoin network, just assuming somebody wanted to try that, they wouldn't have a a6 for the right. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It was sort of a theoretical it's point. It's still but nice. But that's not good. <laughs> still this. not good to have a number. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Is, but you, any address have like a billion dollar worth of coin? No, I don't think like, so. I think. Like on the old ones, pay to public key for sure. 
But on the new ones, I, I don't think there's like a billion dollar on any P2SH address. Yeah. yeah. Probably. But you'd have to you'd have to find the collision with a anyone can spend script, right? Or just spend it to yourself. You can just make a script yeah. that spends it to yourself and just rotate it. That's harder than make it than finding a collision. You need to find a specific like you need to find a specific collision. Oh uh, yeah. That's but that's you couldn't have some you could have some random data in there that you're you could, yeah. Rotating. And you would you would so probably people. say uh, here let's generate like you know, two of two multisig, and then the other person thinks it's a two of two multisig, and then the script is it, but you actually have the same P two S H, which is a one of one multisig, hmm. where uh, you control it kind, kind of. Because you do that with somebody. Yeah, yeah that's but the attack which lowers it from one hundred and sixty bits to eighty bits, where you have control over the digest and. That would lower SHA-256 to 128 bits. Oh, really? Right. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a perfect attack. So oh, oh, yeah. Yeah, it's like, that's, but that's for a basic, like, the birthday attack, yeah, it lowers it by two, but that's for a basic collision. Like, not the TU1. Like, not, not for a specific hash. For no. any hash of all of the range, one of them to have a collision, that would be a birthday attack. Mm -hmm. And not to take a specific hash and break that. No, that's not a birthday. But it's not a birthday attack, as far as I understand. It. No, but actually, like, it, it's easier if you I don't know, try to any, attack a specific hash. Just, just find yeah, yeah, any hash, not a specific hash. Right, exactly. Right. 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 So you're, yeah. But you, 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 yeah, you're, right. you, you oh, if, okay. if we would so do a multi-sig. Yeah. You so we, one on the left and one on the right. Right, so yeah. you one input to match one of your digests. Yeah, if you give me a public can, key and then... In I, HMD you can even lower without the birth data. There is some papers lowering it. They're on the Yeah, never mind. All right, so the next feature is script upgradability. Um, this is a pretty simple one, uh, but it's probably pretty profound, especially when you think about Shore and Taproot and other upgrades on the horizon. Um, every witness program basically is namespaced by a version, which, is, which determines how it will be interpreted. Um, and currently, any uh, any witness program that has a version that isn't zero is evaluated as anyone can spend. Um, it's not standard. I mean, it's not standard. Who, uh... There's a there's a weird standardness flag that you can set that where where it'll basically fail and warn you if uh, it's like it's some constant called uh, discourage witness upgradability or something like that. Um, but the point is that, that basically um, a door has been left open to yeah. create subsequent witness versions. Um, and uh, this is a vast improvement over the, the script upgradability that we had before because basically before we were limited to um, redefining some of the unused opcodes. And that's a, a pretty limited set of things. And I think there were limitations around like the sort of arguments that those would take. So um, uh, having having that window for the upgrade um, of, of the scripting language is a pretty big deal. And that's what like Bit Taproot is building on. It's yeah. Version, right? yeah. 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 Segwit version one. I, I I remember I think in our calls with, with John preceding this this um, this residency, um, newer versions are being made. Uh, can pass standard policy. So today, if I have a version that doesn't exist, it's not standard. Yeah. But I believe we'll, uh, the next one's going to become standard before it be, before it's actually used. It's like PR, right? Right. I so 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 when it, when when it does become activated, yeah. they will propagate at the very yeah. least. Yeah. I think, I think right? you can spend spending to a version one address is standard, but spending from like a ah, two, one, right, 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 right. So there's like a difference between sending right, four right, and sending right, two. Right. They make one of the originally both the both of them were not standard, right. and now they make it. You can span to a right. not standard. Right. Well, make it standard. <laughs> yeah, but then I want to spend it. It won't propagate. If the nodes don't upgrade, yeah, you have to find miners that will accept it. I guess. Okay. Yep. Yep. And finally. Um, one of the most notable features is the effective block size increase. Um, 
So in theory, blocks can burst up to four megabytes, but in practice, it's really just one point six to, to two megabytes, and that's that's based on the fact that we're um, discounting uh, the weight associated with signature data. Um, so when, do I, when do I talk about? Where is that? Okay. Um, yeah. So, I th who who kind of has an intuition for? Um, how we actually, how block structure differs in SegWit. Of course, like when you ask a vague question like that, nobody's going to be like, oh, I have an intuition. You know? um, <laughs> so, like I, I just imagine it as like stuck to the end of whatever you consider the block, but I don't know if that's actually how it's done. Yeah, that's, well, that's, that's sweet. That. The, the coin base doesn't have inputs, so they use the input space. Mm -hmm. To fill it with like, it's, it's, um, it's, that's close. There's an upper turn in Coinbase which has a second Merkle root where it's committed to the same structure, but instead of using the transaction ID, we use the width of the transaction ID. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. So, um, uh, in, in every block, right? There's this. this <laughs> yeah. Can you just say that same thing again? Yeah, yeah, no. We'll we'll, we'll go through. We'll okay. Go through. Cool. I have a nice graph from Jeremy Rubin at some point, but I think it's a little bit out of order. And, and which was uh, uh, because at first SegWit was proposed as uh, a hard fork. Yeah. Yeah. It yeah. was a Mother Michael tree in the year, or which was the hard fork design? Or? Uh, Marco John, do you remember if, if we were just going to add a Merkle root to the block header, or? For a, for a hard fork segwit, I don't think that was ever. Before they realized that we could just stick it in the coin base, were they going to add it to the block header? Or I think it was ever formalized. It was just maybe on IRC. Oh, okay. I don't know if there's any drafting the hard fork. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, yeah. So so uh, have we talked about like hard forks or soft forks yet? No. Okay. Wow. Um, a bit. I'm into velvet forks. Velvet <laughs> forks. So. Okay. Uh, let's see. Who have Timo. Yeah. Can you tell me how a hard fork differs from a soft fork? Um, you have, if you look at the current rules, a hard fork changes the rules, and the soft fork um, keeps the rules but cuts apart off, like uh, um, tightens them. Yeah. That's yeah. That's right. That's right. right. And I mean, so the hard fork soft fork distinction is a little bit weird because you can have soft forks that are sort of these like yeah velvet forks, which are ostensibly soft forks, but but they so change the way the system works that it's kind of like a like a hostile soft fork. But in any case, the, the very the very coarse distinction between hard fork and soft fork is that um, soft forks constrain the rules of the existing system so that everything that that was invalid is still invalid. Um, but hard forks basically open up the validity rules so that something that was previously invalid can now be valid. And so hard forks are sort of backward incompatible. Um, so the trick with SegWit is that basically we want to add an additional commitment structure, but we don't, we don't want to do something like modify the block header because then previous clients are not going to be able to validate these new blocks that come in. Um, so we want to retain backwards compatibility. So we have to do something kind of clever like add that commitment structure somewhere. So as you guys probably know, in every block there's a Coinbase transaction, um, which is effectively how the miner pays themselves. So we have this Coinbase transaction, and um, it turns out that we could use one of the TX outs to do an op return. Is everybody familiar with op return or no? Okay, so the op return is just basically how you stick some unspendable data into, into Bitcoin. Numerous people have used this to embed various things uh, into Bitcoin. Uh, oh yeah, open timestamps. Uh, somebody, I think, um, split up the entire white paper PDF and embedded it using oper serial op returns. Um, I think the Eigen wiki has been embedded in uh, the wiki. Yeah, the entire wiki. Some the, part the of Bitcoin the, wiki. The Eigen wiki. I mean, that's a wiki on Tor. So. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Anyway, so you can do various things with return. One of the one of the nice things that we can do is use these TX outs on the Coinbase transaction to commit to a Merkle root that corresponds to um, 
all the uh, the witness <coughs> transaction IDs. So I think I've got some code here. Uh, this is a function. Um, in this talk, anything that has like a, a dark background is the current code. Anything that has a light background is is, uh, is the, the at deployment time code. Um, this is a function called generate Coinbase commitment in validation.cpb, which is where you'll likely be spending a lot of time if you work with Bitcoin Core. Um, and basically, let's see, can you guys read that or not really? More or less? Okay. Um, so basically, what what we have here is uh, we're saying if SegWit's been deployed um, and if we don't have some uh, pre-existing witness commitment index in the block, um, then we're going to come up with our, our uh, witness route, which I'll show in a second, and we're going to SHA-256 that. Um, and then we're going to stick it in the um, script pub key of First transaction in the block, um, and let's see what is make Yeah, I think that's going to be the first TX out. Um, but elsewhere in the code, we don't assume that it's always the first TX out. This is just how we do it here. So then, in terms of how we actually compute the uh, witness Merkle root, it's are, are you guys all familiar with Merkle roots, or have we not covered that yet? Okay. Merkle roots are like, if I had to pick one piece of magic in Bitcoin, that's like, that's my favorite by far. Um, so the idea is that we have, uh, basically we take all the transactions in the block in a specific order, um, we add them as leaves, and then we compute this Merkle root. So, so pretty simple stuff. That just goes in, again, um, an op return in the TX out of the Coinbase transaction, which miners have leeway to do whatever they want with. Okay, so let's talk about witness programs. Um, so there are a few different sort of like uh, templates, I guess you could say, um, that we have with SegWit. Um, these are sort of like, uh, uh, well, we have the pay to witness public key hash, which is kind of like a special case for the common case of spending to a public key. Um, and uh, so as you can see here, the, the witness just consists of the signature. A pub key, the script sig is of course empty because this is SegWit now, and so we don't have anything in script sig. Um, and the script pub key is just a, a an op zero, and then the uh, twenty byte um, hash of the public key. So that's pretty straightforward. Um, for pay to witness script hash, um, the witness is the, uh, the stack that gets evaluated with the script. Um, and um, the script pub key is just uh, op zero, and then the 32 byte uh, hash of the script that you're, uh, you're evaluating. Well, why did we um, why did we keep the Satoshi original vision of having one too many pops on the stack? That's out of my pay grade. Uh, <laughs> Marco, John. Same code, maybe. Uh, what was the question? Well, why is still, uh, there's still the malleable zero. Like it is not malleable. It's required to be zero. Okay. I think it's like what you have to be it needs to be zero. But the, the reason is why change it. Uh, the bug? You have to, then you have to have two, the two code tasks. Two to do the same. <coughs> Top root will have most zero. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so let's switch gears a little bit and talk about activation of SegWit, which is um, pretty storied history. Um, so you guys have not yet covered BIP9, is that right? Did I, I actually did a presentation on it. Oh, you did a presentation on it. Okay, cool. cool. All right, so you guys should have some rough familiarity. Um, the idea is that we've got this state machine. Um, that basically defines the way the deployment goes down on the basis of um, the version string that miners set when they create blocks. And in the specific case of SegWit with BIP9, um, 
there was a 95% threshold that needed to be met um, of blocks created that signal support or yeah, support for SegWit um, within a given retargeting period. And for anybody who was around then and watching Bitcoin, um, I'm sure you had like your favorite uh, favorite site that you'd go to. I think mine was fork.lol. Uh, and you'd check desperately to see if those uh, that, 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 that threshold was um, uh, on track to be met. And for a long time, it wasn't. Um, so the idea is that, that basically there's some timeout period where this uh, deployment would be proposed. and if by some median time passed, it hadn't been signaled for sufficiently, then it would go into this failed state, and you'd basically say, okay, well, back to the drawing board. Um, uh, the ecosystem isn't supporting this change. Um, but on the other hand, if you hit that threshold before the timeout, you enter this started phase, and um, that basically exists so that you can like make your way through this locked in transition, which is as as far as I can tell, it's basically a buffer of time between okay, we're going to do this thing, and like let's give a few weeks or whatever for, for everyone to get ready for it. Um, so BIP nine uh, ended up being a little bit controversial. Can anyone speak to why? Who can I call? Hugo. Uh, I think it gave too much power to the miners. Um, by setting that so too high, 95%, and um, like the user had no say in, in, in how to activate it. it was, the ball is in, is in the minor support. Yeah. There's no way to yeah. get around it. Yeah. Yeah, so it was kind of agonizing because um, there had been all this fanfare, you know, the, scaling problem and this malleability problem and uh, a lot of the core devs had gone off and scratched their heads for a while and come back with this pretty genius proposal. And I remember watching uh, Peter um, uh, give the SegWit talk to the, the SF Bitcoin devs. And it was really exciting. I was like, great, let's, let's get this thing rolled out. Um, previously in Bitcoin's history, every um, upgrade or fork uh, had been pretty unceremoniously accepted by mine. It was a small community. Nobody really cared that much. Um, so it was really kind of frustrating when uh, the code was actually merged into master and, and there was this sort of, uh, I don't know, euphoric feeling. Um, but then you sit and wait and watch the versions go by and it was just obvious. I mean, like the signaling rate was in like 10 or 20% or something for, for, for a long time. And nothing happened. So obviously this kind of um, fomented some ire in the community and this personality called Shaolin Fry showed up. And um, Shaolin Fry proposed an alternate activation mechanism that it's sort of like BIP9, uh, but instead of instead of having this like failure state that you can transition into if you actually time out, what his little patch does here is it basically says, well, okay, if we hit Tuesday the 1st, August 2017, and SegWit hasn't activated, then we're going to start rejecting any block that isn't signaling for SegWit activation. Um, and uh, I can't tell why, but it's clamped between that Tuesday and Wednesday the 15th, November 2017. So actually that stringency only lasts for a few months. I don't really know why that clamp exists. Um, because it seems like if you're going to do that, I think because certain. in the future they will disable the like they will they will reuse that bit for a different proposal. So if anyone still runs this code, it won't be forked up. That's a good point. Yep. Yep. November fifteenth is when bit one forty one's um, timeout was. Okay. So the, yeah, yeah, the idea is that it better yeah. be locked in by then. Yeah. If it's not locked in by then, then it's game over. Yeah. 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 That makes sense. Um, so this, this got a lot of buzz and uh, riled a bunch of people up, but it was not universally appreciated. Um, for example, uh, Suha said on the mailing list, BIP 148 would introduce a new consensus rule that soft works out non segwit signaling blocks in some time period. I reject this consensus rule as both arbitrary and needlessly disruptive. Bitcoin's primary purpose is to reach consensus on the state of the shared ledger, 
And even though I think the Bitcoin network auto adopts get SegWit, I don't think that concern trumps the goal of not splitting the network. So his point was basically, that's a pretty coercive patch. And yeah, if we really want SegWit, we can do that. Um, but that's kind of a nuclear option, and um, it's maybe unnecessarily causing a consensus split. So um, why don't we be a little more patient and wait and, and try and build consensus other ways? Um, does anybody have any opinions on this? Yeah, of course. I'll sorry. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I think the main goal of BIP 138 was to try and balance the situation because there is the way BIP 9 works is all of the power is by the miners. And like, I'm not a miner. Yeah. I guess you're not a miner. What, we don't have any say in this? Yeah. Like, I think this was a way to try and bring some of the power to the users of Bitcoin, not just the miners. Yeah. Yeah. And by. Agree that it's not the best way because it is in the end could have caused a fork in the network. But there we need some sort of way like BIP9, but for users mm -hmm, mm -hmm. To, to to somehow like change what the consensus rules are. I, I think it's worth going back on like what BIP9 actually said. Like the, the, the terminology is signaling, right? It's like you you, you like the consensus. Like reaching consensus on that whether or not something should or should not happening is usually during like the PR or phase or mailing list even earlier, right? Um, once all the code has been written, I think the whole purpose of BIP9 was just to like coordinate better the network so we don't have this like um, uh, um, this this fork mess we had with what was the software before? Uh, was it? Uh, it was a CLTV. No, no, no. There was something, zero, and then right. some some miners were like spy mining, and they weren't really like checking the validity of the, the full block rules. So they actually hadn't upgraded, um, and this was more like to like signal, oh yes, a, a, a sufficient part of the network has upgraded. Um, so there won't be any like um, different uh, for header chains. Yeah. Um. Yeah, so maybe out of the scope of, of this discussion, sort of, but I mean, this is Bitcoin, so all this stuff comes into play. It's almost like an anchoring effect in a negotiation where you sort of propose something dramatic that you don't necessarily intend on doing, but, you know, is a sort of viable uh, alternative to get, you know, the other person to kind of come this way. So m maybe that was that. I, nobody really knows who Shalom Fair was or whatever. He, he kind of, like, writes, like, uh, anyway. Um, <laughs> it was like a kind of like a game of chicken between the yeah US and the UASF. People. Yep, yep. So BIP one one forty eight didn't really take hold. So uh, he released uh, a subsequent BIP called BIP eight, which also didn't get much traction. This um, proposed uh, some alternative to the state machine, um, and I think. I can't remember what BIP8 did, but it didn't get much traction, didn't really go anywhere. So finally, a guy named James Hilliard, who works on um, mining equipment, I guess, uh, proposed something called BIP91. And this basically just reduced the activation threshold down from 95% to, I think, 80%. Um, and uh, this was never merged into Bitcoin Core, but I think... Uh, Marco, John, is it true that there are some miners running this code? I don't think any miner run any copies of fork integration code. They just uh, set the end version with some command line flags or something. Okay. Um, yeah. Cool. But, um, I feel like, um, from what I read, there were miners running, oh, what was it called? Um, there was the the the, the two X BTC one BTC one. I think they did merge the equivalent of BIP nine, like the the signaling of version four in the blocks. Was anyone actually ever running Segwit two X code? A handful. There's no, still four nodes on the network that run it. <laughs> All right. Okay. But waiting but waiting for the block to come. Yeah. Time yeah, I think they were, um, but I think this basically. Well, it's the same thing that signals the same block version yep. in order to push SegWit through. 
in core. James, how do miners even assess what the users want? Like it would, oh, man. It, would, it would seem it would seem like the, the miner economically wants to do wants to provide the confirmation that the, that the user wants. Yeah. It would seem so, right? So it would seem like first the users signal what they their preferences, mm -hmm. then the miners can make their their, their preference mm -hmm. and then act, either activates or not, or we split, right? But it would seem like it would seem that way, and and this is a great segue into what we're going to talk about next. But um, uh, it's a thing. yeah. Yeah, but yeah, I think the is all, all the user uh, can signal something uh, with a cost. Because if there is no cost to signal something, I mean, just do whatever you want and you will never do it. So. You mean the transaction? What's the yeah, the transaction. I mean, setting a flag in a transaction? Yeah, why not? It's very easy to say. Yeah, but I mean, oh, the transaction. I mean, it's so easy to do civil. Right. Yeah. What well, I means Especially if you're minor. Yeah. Yeah, so from the outside, I mean, this seems like a, a fairly major change, but it seems fairly uncontroversial. It's, it's pretty technical. It's not like um, it's really changing the security characteristics of Bitcoin at all, um, other than maybe marginally improving them. So so everybody's kind of baffled about, like, why are these miners so hostile towards activation? And we still don't really know the answer conclusively to that. Um, but uh, there was some pretty interesting research done on something called ASIC boost, which uh, the overt version, I think, is patented by somebody. But um, so let's talk a little bit about uh, uh, what ASIC boost is. Um, a guy named Jeremy Rubin, who you may have seen um, in the Bitcoin Core project and, and uh, more generally around the cryptocurrency ecosystem, put together a really nice write-up on um, what ASIC boost is. And so I highly recommend going through and actually, um, you know, making sure you understand each step. But um, Kind of the short form of that is that miners discovered a kind of clever, sort of undetectable way of um, getting a slight advantage when trying to compute a nonce that would hash below the target for a given block. And the way this kind of works is um, the SHA-256 function um, happens basically in multiple rounds. and um, you can cache parts of the, the computation of a SHA-256 function um, uh, by um, basically, like, SHA-256 will split the input into multiple parts. And if you sort of cache the mid-state based on one of the early parts and then just tweak the later parts, you can save yourself some computation. So um, what it appeared was going on was miners were playing some interesting games in terms of rearranging the Merkle tree. Um, and they could do so in such a way that they could generate um, collisions that would share parts of the Merkle hash um, in common with one another so that they could reuse this mid-state and basically get sort of an advantage when they were trying to mine a block. Um, and it turns out that obviously SegWit modifies the commitment structure of the Merkle tree. Um, and it does so in a way by adding this witness commitment to the first, uh, to, to the Coinbase um, output, which is always to the far left of the tree. Um, it does so in such a way that it kind of obviates any, any way to do um, this, uh, this manipulation of the Merkle tree to get an advantage. Um, so that's called covert ASIC boost because you can't necessarily tell a priori that, that this is what they're doing, but we would see weird blocks that have like low numbers of transactions and um, I think there were a few invalid blocks that were mined um, based on ordering that kind of indicated that people were trying to play these games. Um, so, so we had kind of an inclination that it was going on, and I think Greg Maxwell did some research where he um, actually crap, cracked open a, a miner and uh, saw that there was a sort of ASIC boost functionality built into some of the AMP miners. Um, uh, so this would certainly give a sort of plausible reason why miners might be hostile to the idea of changing uh, the commitment structure, um, because if it's you know kind of nullifying some advantage they have, well that's that's a that's a pretty big deal for them. Um, it turns out you can do a different version of ASIC boost called covert ASIC boost uh, by playing with some of the the data in the version header, um, but doing this makes it obvious that you're using this over at ASIC boost and 
obviously not all the version header is, is, is or, um, the version field is accessible uh, for playing these kinds of games. So um, that's that's ASIC boost. Uh, let's get into some of the peer-to-peer -peer implications of SegWit. Does anybody have any questions about ASIC boost or any comments? No, it's pretty fascinating. And it was like, I don't know, when it was happening, it felt like this, like sort of, I don't know. It was very. There's a lot of intrigue, um, and Bitmain um, had a lot of interesting uh, public public relations stuff that came out. That kind of um, it was fun to read. So um, over the wire. SegWit introduces a new transaction serialization format um, for communicating with peers. And that kind of mirrors um, the, uh, the format that I showed earlier, the, the, the WTXID format. It's basically the same thing. Um, so nothing big there. By the way, this is all outlined in BIP 144. So the, the SegWit suite is BIPs 141 through 144, 145. I think 145 might be like a get block template change, which is kind of inconsequential. But the, the really important ones are 141 through 144. Like I said, you'll probably end up reading these a few times, um, unless you're much smarter than me, which is definitely possible. Um, so in terms of the hashes, like I said before, uh, this is sort of your, your, your classic format. Um, and this is the witness ID format that, that incorporates the witnesses explicitly in their own Spot, um, this is just a quick note alluding to what I said earlier about the fact that I found it kind of confusing because it, it's, it's not necessarily obvious from these two that legacy transactions include signature data in the inputs. Um, witness transactions do not, but they still use this same ID because this is a non-malleable ID. This ID, because it contains signature data, is potentially malleable, but I actually don't know if that's even the case given how we restrict um, the signature data uh, for SegWit. So, yeah, worth noting. Um, we introduce a few env types. Does everybody, let's see, who have I called? Uh, mm, mm, mm. You in the back there. Do you know what an env message is? Okay, so does anybody else know what an info message is, John? I'm not really 100% sure, but it's in the P2P um, protocol of communicating, uh, where basically I think it's the, one of the most common message types. Uh, it's quite small, I think under 64 bytes, uh, where, for example, uh, you might send a get data request and you receive it back in the form possibly of, a bit of an inf. Um, yeah, so inv is kind of interesting. It's it's like it's you signal. Uh, you have a new inventory. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And then the, the other person might then respond with a get data. With a get data, if they don't have that yet, or they just say, "Cool, cool story, bro." Yeah. yeah if, yeah. if it's cool, then they send you an in, the inv, right? If if they don't have that inventory, we, the right. inv indicates I have something new, and then if you want it, you ask me for it. Yeah. 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 And inv can contain a list of um, transaction. List of IDs, yeah, and, and block, and block Super IDs. Common Super common message. Yep. Yeah. Super common message. Wow. Um, That's. Uh, I mean, you you will be able to send your key that data like in a compatible chain scheme, but it will be cost you bandwidth in if the peer doesn't want it. I mean, I mean, just a trade off between that and the bandwidth. Right. Yeah. 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 Just by way of general advice, um, in your. Uh, Leagues of free time, I'm sure. Um, you should definitely get acquainted with the different message types and uh, how they work in the protocol. I think the uh, Bitcoin.org developer documentation has some pretty nice walkthroughs of how these how these message flows go. But that's really really helpful to to have a good handle on, um, and it's it's a really great entry point into the, the core code base itself because if you understand those message flows, you can then read through net processing and subsequently into validation and really follow where the messages go. Um, and that's a, that's a great way of exploring the code base. But anyway, that's kind of off track. So um, these, uh, yeah, yeah, basically we just introduced a few new inv types to use with get data, where you're basically signaling, hey, I want a witness transaction, hey, I want a witness block um, in the new SegWit format. So nothing really big there. Um, 
Another thing that happened is we introduced this service bit, which is basically a mechanism for saying to your peers, like, what parts of Bitcoin you support. Other examples of, of service bits are, um, like, whether or not you're, you're a pruned node, whether you can offer someone blocks. Um, so one interesting thing to do is, if you want to go through all the peer-to-peer -peer implications of SegWit yourself, you can just grab for this node witness, which is the constant associated with the SegWit service bit. Um, and uh, we would do various things on the basis of whether our peers signal this, this service bit. Um, so for example, uh, in the initial code, we would only create outbound connections to nodes that signaled node witness, um, unless we tried 40 different connections, failed all of them, and then we'd fall back to um, a non-witness node. And this is obviously just because you don't want to partition yourself off of the network if you can't find any other witness nodes. Um, nowadays, the code's a little bit more nuanced um, because we introduced this idea of feeler connections, which Ethan Heilman may have talked about when he was um, discussing the peer-to-peer the, uh, -peer, uh, eclipse attack resistance stuff. Um, the idea of filler connections is, is we have some limited number of connections that we just kind of make pretty indiscriminately. Um, and so for any non-filler connection, we now call this thing called has all desirable service flags, which is basically just like, can they serve me blocks and are they a witness node? Um, so we actually uh, enforce uh, for our outbound connections that they're all witnesses. And you can take a look back at um, Matt's commit where he actually changed this. And Matt basically says, you know, it's far enough past deployment time that there are a ton of witness nodes on the network, so we can kind of safely transition this over to, um, to being more stringent about who we connect with. Um, funny enough, it sort of looks like he made that change while he was refactoring. So welcome to classic Bitcoin. Uh, uh, let's see. What's the other thing? Um, da, 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 local services. Yeah, service bits are not uh, reusable, right? right? Once you designate oh, yeah. a bit as something, you can't now reuse that bit again. Yeah. Ever. Yep. yep. I think that's right. Um, yeah, so the, the node witness is like one shift, left shifted three, and then like, I think we're on like or maybe or something. It's it's there. There are a pretty low number of these these service bits, and I can't remember the size of the field, but I'm sixty four. Yeah, so we'll, yeah, we got a few more. Um, and obviously, that's not a consensus critical piece of data, so that could be a peer to peer change if we needed to introduce more. Um, yeah, I think this is just basically setting. Node witness if, if SegWit's been deployed. And that's not validating, right? Like that's, you can fake that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like if you modify the code. Like you can, yeah. You'll, you'll probably just get banned when, when your peer asks you for something and you, yeah. Let's see, what is this doing? Oh yeah, okay. So um, another interesting detail that was introduced in the validation code is um, we have this thing called C validation state, which is basically this object that gets passed in. It's like it's it's sort of like a piece of data that gets created along with every peer communication that, that that eventually makes its way into the validation part of the system. And it's like how you sort of record like what happened or where it went wrong or um, uh, like how severe the uh, sort of um, how severely out of alignment. The, the communication is with what you expect. And so um, SegWit introduced this idea of corruption possible, which is kind of interesting because um, you might say receive a block and um, now in SegWit, if some part of the witness data in that block is like garbled, but that's the only problematic part of it, then we say, okay, this data might might have just gotten screwed up somewhere along the way, and we shouldn't necessarily consider the block invalid, and we shouldn't necessarily disconnect the peer. Um, and when I was reviewing this, it, it kind of like 
raised a question in my mind because why wouldn't we have always had this? Like, why why is somehow having the witness data kind of cordoned off? Well, why does that introduce the possibility of um, of corruption? Uh, and I don't know. Um, so maybe we can ask somebody, but. Uh, this has now actually been removed since um, in a recent refactor of the uh, the DOS handling code. Instead of specifying um, you know, corruption possible, which I think really just just affects whether or not we disconnect ban appear, um, we now have specific reasons like a constant for each reason that we set on the state. So it's a bit more specific. Um, uh, but I found this pretty confusing when I when I encountered it because there's a there was a lot of special casing going on in the validation code where you're like, all right, well, this didn't connect properly, but I'm not going to like penalize my peer because corruption might have been possible. It's like, well, what does that mean? Where does that come from? Yeah, I mean, in case of corruption, you re reject the block, right? Yeah, yeah, you reject the block, but you don't, in the headers tree, you don't necessarily mark it invalid, I think, which is kind of weird. Oh, yeah, because you want to reuse those transaction because that's yeah. in cage. Yeah, you want to be basically, uh, yeah, you try again. Just send me back this one transaction. I mean, yeah. Yep. Okay. Oh, yeah. Um, another interesting tidbit uh, during the SegWit deployment was that it initially didn't support compact blocks. Uh, have you guys gone over compact yeah. blocks yet? Okay, cool. So, um, again, I don't really know what the conclusive answer was here. They actually, shortly after SegWit was merged, uh, I think Sue Haas merged a follow-up PR that activated compact blocks for SegWit. It was a month? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was yeah. version two compact blocks. So. Yep, 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 yep. So, um, I, near as I can figure, I think the reason is that it was just more engineering effort. And I mean, it, it, I mean, there was not something uh, SegWit native in compact blocks, so it was yeah. parallel works. And on yeah. the engineering point, it makes sense to not die to them. Yep, yep, yep. And so I guess, like, upon deployment, you know, if you were using compact blocks, you'd basically have no hits in your mempool because um, because people, you know, many nodes weren't producing SegWit formatted transactions, so maybe it's something like that. Um, I'm not really sure, but in any case, this is somewhere in um, net processing where uh, we basically track whether a given peer supports our compact block version, which as you said is version two for SegWit. Um, so that's kind of an interesting detail about the, the deployment there. So let's talk about, um, what SegWit does in terms of extensibility. There are really two main features here that are worth talking about. The first is obviously script versioning. Um, hmm? And zero point is commitment. Commitment, yeah, which I had kind of forgotten about. Um, so there's really not much pure say in my mind. Uh, basically, this is a conditional in uh, the script interpreter that, that says, um, okay, if, if our version isn't zero and we haven't, and this flag called script verify discourage upgradable witness program isn't set, um, then basically just say, yep, we pass, we're good. Um, the idea being here that in order to support a soft work, you need to have a basically op true esque thing that you can then clamp down um, in subsequent versions. So I think, uh, is anybody at all confused about that or, or should we elaborate more on that? The flag. <coughs> long one. When would you want to set that? Like, when is that set? I think that might be set uh, now by default because we don't have version one transactions yet, but um, I don't know. Yeah. I tried to grab around a little bit for that flag, but I didn't, I didn't really dig too deep. Um, but that's a good question. Yeah, so, so when when would you actually set this flag? Is this is this flag set by default now for transactions created? By the we have been struck this code this morning and they are, they are set in uh, verify scripts, which is being called by script check, which is called by uh, verify uh, checking boots. And you, you have a function which is called a basic set of flags and among them there is a lot of I mean there is all the optional standard ones and the mandatory ones. So it's in uh, check inputs in okay. validation.cd. Yeah, but, but like if you're creating a transaction with the core wallet, is it going to set this flag or? Oh, yeah, no, I guess the, the, 
the, this flag isn't a function of the transaction, it's a function of the, the script interpreter, right? Yeah. So, yeah, so I guess uh, probably by default that flag is on, but. Yeah, but uh, I mean, uh, this morning, Carl uh, told us that it was a bug with uh, acceptance of that transaction, and you weren't able to turn off the flag. So, in theory, there is ARPC to, to modify the flags, mm -hmm. but it doesn't work currently. Okay, so it's always on? Yeah, but I mean, it told us this morning it was working on PR. Gotcha. Okay, cool. So, um, so, yeah, I guess you can't really use higher witness versions to get degenerate success conditions. Um, and so the second thing that's potentially as or more interesting is we've got this additional commitment that we've kind of hidden in the um, TX ins of that same Coinbase transaction where we have the op return that commits to the um, the Merkle root of the witness transactions. Um, right now we stick a nonce in there that's basically just zeros, I guess. Um, so in the, in the witness stack of the, um, of the input to that transaction, it's kind of like we've saved this bit of space, this 32 byte um, space, where uh, right now we're not doing anything with it other than validating that it's there and it's filled by something. But if we want to say, for example, introduce an assumed UTXO or a UTXO hash value, we could stick that in there. Or even more likely, we'd use a commitment Merkle structure to say that, okay, by convention, you know, the first upgrade is gonna be the left part of this tree and then, you know, like fill out a whole Merkle tree full of up um, full of commitments that miners generate and commit to and then validators then validate. So it gives us a ton of extensibility in terms of like uh, what what a block actually commits to without having to modify the header and create a hard fork or something. Uh, so that's kind of cool. Um, and uh, I don't think anybody's really discussed using it yet, but it's there. What? Well, oh, no, no discussion at all what it could be used for? Beyond some kind of UTXO set hash. Um, 457 is a feature widget. Oh yeah, yeah, with yeah filter header hash. Feature widget. A big 457. Uh, you know? Have you guys covered compact block filters yet? Compact blocks, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. So uh, there is no features in compact blocks. But yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's, I think there's kind of a naming collision. The neutrino stuff is called compact block filters. Um, even the, and that's different from compact blocks. Um, anyway, so. You guys haven't gone over SPV and Bloom filters and all that stuff yet, right? Yeah. Or you have? Okay, cool. So uh, just real quick, compact block filters are an alternate way of doing SPV where you basically generate a sort of um, compressed view of um, the transactions that a, a block spends or creates. And the idea is that in SPV mode, you would just transmit this, um, like these, uh, these filters for each yeah. block. And with a B157, you, you have to build a parallel chain of the eagles of the features yeah. to be sure that uh, the features are true from yeah. the beginning. And so if we commit the features in the commit transaction of the coin base, we, I mean, like clients, they can rely on it and not on the uh, parallel chain of features they perform. Yep, yeah, exactly. So instead of having to retrieve the entire headers filter chain for these 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 filters, then you just take one block and you say, okay, there's this commitment in here, um, so I know that the header filter starting with this hash. So yours ends the Coinbase transaction, and you can see that the Coinbase transaction is committed to the header, and so you can check, and, and after that you can check that the maker root of the future is committed to the Coinbase transaction. Well, why not have multiple upper turns? Well, because the, the point is that you can compress basically all of the commitments you could ever want into a single Merkle root that would replace this nonce. Um, Just so this couldn't be done pre segwit because of the validation rules of the Coinbase for legacy nodes. I'm guessing. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess you. It, it would be another software, but you could do. You, it, it would basically be like uh, sort of redoing SegWit, I guess. Yep, 
Yep, yep. So in any case, if we were to ever use this thing, it's, just, it's still a soft work. Um, it's just, it's a little bit more well-defined in terms of, okay, this is the place where we can slot in now. So. So it's just a, uh, is it 32 bytes? Or? Yep. 32 bytes, so enough for SHA-256. All right. Um, there is a worse line in SegWit, in my opinion, and it's this one. It's like 354 characters. Um, God damn it. <laughs> so, yeah, no, it's awful in GitHub. That's why I was like reading through the polar crust and I was like, huh? and I had to scroll and scroll and scroll and scroll. And scroll. Uh, but this is basically. Um, this is how you search for which TX out in the Coinbase transaction has the witness commitment. And so all it's really doing is looping through the TX outs in the first uh, transaction in a block. And uh, <laughs> what's going on here is there's like basically a, a preamble to the, to the commitment data. Um, and it's just like byte by byte comparing to see if it's that preamble. I, I don't know why it was done this way. You can do it. Probably a lot, cleaner, but whatever. That's you can have a helpful method to just, or or even just like take this block VTX zero V out O thing and put it in one variable and then, <laughs> but whatever, whatever. Um, yeah, I mean, thank, <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Peter. Uh, maybe at some point we'll have like some reasonable line length convention. <laughs> the important stuff's in there. Um, yeah, so uh, I guess maybe some open questions. Um, do you guys think that SegWit was the right thing to do, or is there some other alternate scheme you could have come up with? Anyone has dig in a flexible transaction, which was a novel malleability fix? Yeah, I didn't, I'm not familiar with that one. I remember like extension blocks was, but I think that was more of a scalability thing. I, flexible transactions, I don't, I don't know anything about. Maybe somebody else. Was that a bit? Yeah, I think that's a bit. Oh, was it a bit? Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's one. Um, what was it called? Flexible transactions. What, what, what do you think of uh, Luke Dash Jr.'s point where, with all these soft forks, um, you know, where there's a virtual block size increase, and the IBD complexity grows quadratic if you assume that the block size will continue to grow in that sense. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. next time there's something similar, we want to entice people to use it. We give them a weight discount. We're increasing the block size again. Yeah, yeah. I, the economics of that are not very clear to me. Um, because I think if, if you're a miner, obviously you're trying to fee maximize. And do larger blocks necessarily do that? Do they decrease fees, but maybe on net because you're getting more transactions, you're getting more in fees? That's not really clear to me. Um, what about, what about IBD complexity? So when you say IBD complexity, do you just mean the amount of time it takes? Yeah. Oh. As, as the chain grows and as the, the block size increases, stepwise linearly, because we're yeah. always introducing okay. updates. Yeah, yeah. 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 So IBD costs would, would, okay. would grow quadratic. Yeah. yeah. Why because, is it so because if the block size increases linearly and the IBD is the integral of it, the integral of it will be dragged. Mm. Oh, interesting. Merci. Yeah, that's why Luke wants to decrease the block size. Or at least not 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 have step increases like like second. Mm -hmm. He argues they has some calculation that he says that right now the maximum is like half a mega that we can extend. <laughs> and he wants to decrease to that. Yeah. I haven't thought enough about that stuff. I mean, the proposal I'm working on for assume UTXO is a way of kind of truncating at least, you know, the initial cost of an IBD. And I think long term, it has to be something like that because you just can't have this linear process that's supposed to continue forever. So, um, so we've got to come up with some way of dealing with that. But uh, Ooh, flexible transactions was controversial. Oh. Yeah, because it was not fun. Matt was very, it looks like he was very against it. Oh, yeah, maybe we can get him. Uh, what about some about sort of cut through? Mm -hmm. Some sort of cut through. Like, that we can remove transactions that were spent. Oh. 
Yeah. Why? Know. Oh, because you, you can build chain of transaction now? That's what you're meaning? Yeah, I'm saying it won't work with the way it works right now, and need to, to make some change. But in theory, we can remove, if I send you money and you send it to Richard, yeah, yeah, we yeah, can, you can remove it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I know what's... But uh, I mean, my question with Scott Fruit is maybe Lightning will change the economics or the thing, and you oh. will not have to... Because for, for instant transaction, you will use Lightning, so what's the use of Scott Fruit? Okay, very interesting. Yeah. Probably outside the bounds of SegWit, so we can. I promise we can finish this soon. Um, does anybody think it should have been a hard fork versus a soft fork instead of doing all this like shuffling around and? Some people say it's a lot of hacking. It's like it seems like a lot of weird hacks to to sort of pigeonhole this this in there, and that has a cost. Mm -hmm. uh, down I, I, the line, just maintaining that all these hacks and somebody have the knowledge of all how these weird things work together. Mm -hmm. um, but it's like a trade off. Yeah. yeah. I mean, no. personally, I, I think with Bitcoin, it's like the developers are more of the. You're like. I mean, I don't want to say, but we're like janitors. Like, <laughs> we're literally like, we just got to maintain. Like, I think maintaining backwards compatibility is the absolute highest priority. Mm -hmm. I, th I think that's right. Yeah. You gotta, even if the code is ugly, yeah. mm -hmm. you gotta live with it. Yeah. Like, it's nothing. Culturally, it's, 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 yeah, it's yeah. more important. You gotta prioritize what's more important. Yeah. yeah, which is unusual if you come from like the traditional right, software. Traditional software. So most, yes. people, most of us have like traditional software background, right? Right. And if, you, if the code's ugly, you wanna clean that up. Right. Unfortunately, you can't, do that, can't either, right? yeah. usually do that either. So. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, you have control over the client, and like here's like people running clients that we don't have control over. We cannot just deploy like the, the app to the iPhone. Really that's, that's the solution. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think it's interesting too, though, that it seems like in a lot of cases you get like originally a hard fork, and then it simmers for a while, and then you end up with something that's better. That soft forkable, but not only that, that thing you showed with the Merkle commitment being left open with the nonce, you know, that's something that's not talked about, but it's sort of laying the groundwork. So not only did you get a soft fork, but you laid the groundwork for not having as much complexity maybe in the next iteration. So, yeah, I, feel like you know, I, like, I think that makes it like you should always, let say, like software's like waffles, you should always put the first one out. This is kind of an example of that, you know, it's good. To waffles? Know, I'll eat every every waffle, but <laughs> I feel like it's a it's a misnomer because Never heard that one. it's yeah. not really about just a segregated witness. But yeah. It's about like a, a zillion other things like yeah. upgradability and about like. Uh, well, that's that's a really good point. I think without the tests and all, like we we're still only talking about like six hundred lines of code or something. Yeah. Well, in general, I mean, I think that's that's a really really good point. Is is it preferable to have a very well-contained consensus change de deployed by itself in isolation? Or is it really preferable to bundle a bunch of stuff together so you can kind of consolidate testing effort and really make sure that it goes out the right way and that all the changes interact in a, in a way that works? Um, how do you make that distinction? Yeah. Were there a reason they have to be bundled together? I guess some, of, some part would have to be deployed together. Not sure if all of them well, one one social argument is that it's it's very expensive for a wide number of people to scrutinize a change like this. And if you were to have, say, seven changes, you know, like seven big initiatives to like push out and push out and push out, the aggregate overhead of doing that, you, you people may just fall off and say, okay, well, whatever. And people might get fatigued and accustomed to just saying, okay, yeah, we're going to take the next change, we're going to take the next change. Instead of it being a sort of big, I don't know, momentous thing. I was going to say, counterpoint to that is that you're then teaching the users of the software to be more accustomed to smaller changes. And so that's a, that's a cultural thing that predates you know, me. To say that, is this something that needs to be scrutinized in such detail, or is there... Um, an upgrade path where you start getting used to sort of doing these upgrades and, and when you run into something that's contentious it sort of takes the edge off a little bit because you're used to actually change and you're sort of um, you know and then and, and there's a the larger conversation of like 
you know, is the, isn't the software good enough? Ossification, like it, you just get like a lot of politics that sort of build its way in if you create these waterfall releases of these are really big deals and everybody has to be on edge for, for a year at a time mm. uh, yeah. as opposed to, yeah, we're doing incremental changes and, you know, those increments uh, are important, but, you know, they're, they're not, um, we, we aren't having secret meetings and behind closed doors to decide it anymore. Right. Yeah, I also think that incremental changes makes the accessibility of, like, trying to understand them more. With Segwit, it's like, uh, there's just so many different things that it's, like, really easy to be like, oh, it's complicated, there's a lot of politics, I don't get it. Um, and if it's an incremental change, it, oh, it appeals to a wider uh, range of people who are being like, oh, I can go understand what's going on there if I want to. Yep, yep. And I feel like... Could have broken much out of Segwit, can you? Uh, it felt like this is like um, pretty much MVP. Uh, certainly the script. I eat. I guess you didn't have to virtualize the script stuff as as much. Um, it was a good opportunity to do so. Um, you mean the discount, or what do you mean? By that? Oh, like the version number, like this the, the Segwit script version numbers. Like lay the groundwork for future versions. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Like yeah. Advanced, so mm -hmm. yeah. And there's a fact that bundle a lot of different upgrades at the same time. I mean, now we have layer two, I think, like that. And if you have a lot of upgrades at the same time, we just have to rewrite a bunch of stuff, like just a hell of stuff. And explain to users they can't root anymore uh, through, their, uh, through the other nodes because they don't share the same. I mean, they don't have implemented that too, they don't have implemented the dark root, so you can't root from them. I mean, there is kind of issues. Now, the other problem could be that uh, bundling a lot of web at the same time together, you don't have different variations, so it's better on the privacy side. Yeah, I mean, I, you could... That's a trade-off. It just it seems like, empirically, the more likely scenario is not to do it incrementally, and there are some arguments why you would want to do it in like a lump sum. One is it it does focus attention at distinct times and gives you a lot of, you know, you'd like there, there to be a lot of time between changes so people have time to review and come up with that next better version, next better version, where you don't, you don't really want your users to be used to upgrading. Agreed. I think that's, that's the, Agreed. you've seen it in other communities that that's maybe not such a good thing because then you can, because it doesn't take, it doesn't have to be a super complex improvement to introduce a completely failing bug. Yeah. So yeah, absolutely true. Each each change should be. I mean, I think just you, we can distinguish between the release process and the P pull request process. Yeah, and indeed there is a big distinction in yeah. segue, right? Like I think that it's suicidal to try to make a, to send a bible into a pull request and sits there for six months and you have to rebase a hundred times and nobody's still gone through it all. Compared to, I, I translate what you're saying more for a user side. Uh, yeah, how often was, they have to? Uh, yeah, I was thinking more consensus changes type stuff. But, but yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I like what you like. I'm looking at your your experimental UTM, UTXO snapshots, or I'm thinking of Schnelli's um, work where he has this global proof of concept, but then there's one slice it off. Slice it off, slice it off. Yeah, make them human size, easily easier to review, and yeah. not only for your own sanity too. For your own sanity. Yeah. <laughs> But that depends on the project. There's, yeah, there's some sure. where you can slice it off and you're delivering incremental value, and then there's others that need to be delivered at this chunk, I think. When you're looking at this, like, how do you slice, do you slice these it off? Down. Yeah. I mean, you, you see some of these conditionals that are like, if SegWit has activated yet, you know, do this. And so conceptually, maybe you could get those into the code base one by one. I, I sort of agree that it's like, I don't know how much value that would add, but... But you kind of need to touch on like the PGP layer and all that kind of stuff. So you like to tra transmit the witness transactions and you have to yeah. have the commitment. It, yeah. I, I really don't see how you could have sliced it. Yeah, the hmm. peer to peer stuff is interesting because uh, in Suha's talk, right, he kind of mentioned that it was accidental that we got it right. Uh, <laughs> that, you know, this could have, you know, accidentally partitioned the network. If hmm. you're not setting different stuff to O notes and U notes and we just kind of did that by accident. And it's, I think it's one reason why 
you know, uh, it was an accident because it's so, so complex, right? And people, it's hard for people to sort of reason about that. It's, uh, can we foresee everything? Yeah. And we, we were kind of lucky that it didn't end up like partitioning. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, next question. Um, so given how this process went, what do you guys think is going to be involved in Schnorr and Tapper? How, what do you think the code changes are going to look like? What are the sort of, sort of entry points um, that are going to be in common with Segway? What, what, what will activation look like? 2023. <laughs> it's getting it back, right? I mean, just keeping it, keeping the smaller chunks, right? <laughs> but how, in terms, of the, in terms of the code, how, how will we add Schnorr signatures? Like what? It's V2, right? V1. V1, I guess, yeah. It's also a bundle, right? It's also a bundle of changes. Oh, yeah. It's not just reliant changes, though, I guess. But there's no new commitment. There's no new peer-to-peer stuff. It's pretty much just like validation, a few lines of validation. Or am I seeing this wrong? Pretty small. I mean, aggregated signatures isn't right away. It's not going to be that much cheaper. It depends on what kind of aggregation. Oh, Cross-input, no. But within a single input, yeah. That's a more, uh, more time. This is awesome. <laughs> how, many, how many lines does uh, Tablet how many, how many? How many files does Tablet touch? I, I just, yeah, I want, to, I want to comment about that. Simple's argument about the amount of lines isn't really fair. Yeah. Because it does everything in line. Like he'll do a bunch of math in the middle of validation. <laughs> that CPP. That's not how it will be. And he does like three hundred twenty. <laughs> that's better. Lines. That's that looks even better than if you look at his code to implement Schnorr in Bitcoin. He's like he's saying it's twenty lines, but it's twenty lines if you do the math in line of the validation CPP. The second you start doing it right, it becomes it becomes two hundred lines of code. All right. Well, it sounds like you showed up to the residency just in time for a nice code <laughs> review. <laughs> So, buckle up, Buttercup. <laughs> Let's see it. Um, so yeah, basically, I think for Schnorr and Taproot, we're going to bump the the transaction version, and that'll be that as as far as like the consensus layer goes. Uh, in terms of a deployment mechanism, do you guys think we'll use BIP nine? Do you think we'll do something else? Will Shall and Fry uh, Part Two <laughs> show up? More hats. More hat? Yeah, how many hats will we need to get this activated? I think um, there's bit eight, is it? Yeah. It's like bit nine with the absolute, it's happening whether you like it or not. Yeah. So it kind of makes the miners go back to realizing that the signaling is not a vote for whether you want it or not. It's a so are signal ready? of are you ready to receive it? And knowing that at some point you got no choice. Because mm -hmm. I, I agree that the vote should happen during development and the bit process, mm -hmm. not during deployment after all the code's been written and reviewed. And yeah. It doesn't make much sense. Yeah, yeah. That, that comes with the risk of chain split, right? Um, if yeah, the, but uh, the miners don't miners, want to chain split either, though. I, mean, I know, but like, you, you're kind of assuming that the miners are always proactive and pay attention to what we have to do, um, and that, that might be the case now, but in the future it could be like just like passive mining farm, right, that you don't really touch, then you're doing the, this kind of bit 8 upgrade, you know, it can cause a fork because nobody's actually upgrading the farm, right, you see what I'm saying? you like, you like forcing everybody to upgrade on that day. But that's sort of assumed that people are paying attention. Well, no. Normally, the windows are like a year. Yeah, but so I mean, if if you're running a mining farm and you're not right now, that's the case. Flip a flag. I'm saying like ten years from now, twenty years from now, with that <coughs> uh, maybe as the system gets bigger, right? You have these like a little bit more um, the solar <laughs> farm or Up in the space. middle of like the Atlantic or I don't know. <laughs> Oh, I that. You're right. yeah. But the question was like, what's the most likely? And I would say the most likely would be bit nine, I guess. You know, like still bit nine. Yeah, why not? Because that that's the only one that's ever been used. That's actually ever been. Mm -hmm. May not the have been the one responsible for Segwit, but it was the one that was actually in the code base. 
Carla, do you think this change will be more contentious to deploy than SegWit or less? Um, well, I wasn't really around for this, well, really around for the SegWit change, but like, if this doesn't affect miners with the maybe ASIC boost thing, maybe it'll be a bit less dramatic. Mm -hmm. yeah. And generally the sentiment seems to be a lot more positive for Sean Taproot, but yeah, I mean, Hugo has an incentive against Schnorr yeah. because it's a big improvement in uh, efficiency and privacy. Maybe, well, but we maybe didn't dream of the incentives in Segway. Yeah, like, exactly. It's yeah. very yeah. premature to say something like that. Yeah, maybe, maybe this is a Niden uh, thing, like uh, as it covered, but. Yeah, um, but, as a, but we didn't know about that before. We only realized yeah, yeah, yeah. it might be so. Maybe. Yeah, just playing maybe. incentives is very yeah, hard but, game. Yeah. Don't it change the, uh, the eaters, so you're not going to have things. Maybe there is something else. Like we didn't thought of that before. How can you think of this before? The problem with like, the problem with bit nine is that yes, <coughs> you have, especially with the competing SHA two fifty six chains, you could easily get DCH BSV chain miners that'll come into Bitcoin and try to hold it hostage mm -hmm. with only five percent mm -hmm. of the hash file. So maybe that ninety five percent activation threshold is pretty. Pretty high, yeah. Five. So it, it still seems like the conservative approaches generally how things go, and then if there's a problem, because you want, because the core thing is you don't want a network split, right? I mean, yeah. It's going to always yeah. be the overriding reason. You can speculate, but if it goes through with ninety-five percent, then that's your first choice. Yeah. On a certain day. In the back. Yeah. Is it thought that um, if the proposal had been a hard fork proposal, then the AC boost thing would not matter and therefore it would have gone through with BIP9 or not? Probably because the commitment structure would probably be outside of the Merkle tree. Yeah. So or the transaction. So it's thought that it would have gone through even though it was a hard fork because the miners were the decision makers, not the users who care more about backwards compatibility? Is that. You're saying miners care more about backwards compatibility? No, I'm saying uh, the opposite. Okay. Yeah. Since miners care less about backwards compatibility, it would have gone through. I think that's plausible. You know, um, we can never know for sure, but yeah, I, you know, that that definitely could be if you if if you're assuming that ASIC boost was uh, one of the primary holdups. Um, so that's an, it, it's interesting to think about, but I think it's it is important to maintain the sort of cultural precedence of not you know doing an upgrade hard fork. Yes. Is anyone trying to bridge the gap between developers and miners? Like we all here speculating what miners want and what they do want, and we're all no. Well, you can you can talk. You should you should get Matt to talk a lot about what he tried to do. I mean, he's still in close contact with a few miners. Um, I think that's the best way not to speculate what they want and what they care about, but to actually sit and talk. Well, they went. You know, I mean, there was a big. With fiber. Problem that too. Um, well, so. Call the New York meeting. <laughs> <laughs> the New York meeting wasn't between developers and miners. It was between, uh, like, corporate. You guys may not remember this, but guys, can you yeah. 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 So the first um, one of the first scaling bitcoins was held in Hong Kong, the famous like Hong Kong Roundtable, where Matt and a few other people actually went to Hong Kong and talked to the Chinese miners, and um, so I think that kind of thing has been tried. I'm not privy to a lot of it, but you might ask Matt about how that all went down. All right. Um, yeah, so there are some links here. Um, there are two Segwit PRs, which is kind of interesting. One is an unrebased version where Peter would just kind of append commits to it, so it's got like a gazillion commits and it's kind of hard to follow, but all the com a lot of the commentary is there. And then there's a rebased version, which is where he cleaned up the Git history. And so I'd highly recommend, at least at some point, you know, maybe not now, maybe not in the next few weeks, but at some point, just read through those commits because it'll give you a really precise idea of uh, what he had to do. Um, and uh, accompanying that is uh, a write-up that Peter Todd did, um, which is basically his code review of, um, uh, of the, that pull request, which I think is really well done. He raises some good points. Um, the BIPs, obviously... Um, they're kind of a shorthand for, for getting an exact idea of what these changes are. And then anecdotally, uh, if you want to um, not only understand kind of the SegWit message changes, but more generally the Bitcoin protocol message changes, 
one kind of high level way to do this is to look in the test framework where we define all the, the message structs. And that's just kind of a good shorthand for um, what the serialization formats look like. So those are all worth checking out. 